Right, so I'm going to do a video today. I'm going to give you my timeline the way I see it in the book of Revelation. And this timeline actually uh, correlates really well with Matthew 24, with um, Paul's writings in, in his epistles, with the Old Testament scriptures that are prophetic of the end times. This is the only timeline that I know of that actually can take all of these um, prophetic scriptures and harmonize them together into one like cogent timeline. And I'm using primarily Revelation, which is the end time story. That is the place where we're going to find the prophecies about the about the last days. So in this video, um, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to call it, but I think it's going to be bad news and good news. There is a lot of bad news that is in the future that is like headed right toward us. There is good news too, so we're going to do good news and bad news, but I want to do the bad news first, <laughs> and then I'll do the good news. So back in the 70s, uh, I was kind of loosely uh, hanging out with people who were affiliated with a group called Campus Crusade for Christ. And they would go on college campuses and they would talk to people about Jesus. And they would use a book and it was called The Four Spiritual Laws. And the first law is that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And this is true. God does love you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Not only does he have a plan for you, but he has a plan that he's put into motion since Adam first sinned, actually since before the fall of man. Now, what people don't realize, though, is that God is not the only one with a plan. Satan has a plan, too, and he's been working his plan since before the Garden of Eden. Satan has a plan, and it's not for your good. Satan, however, is limited in what he can do. He can only uh, do whatever God permits or allows. And he, um, he kind of needs to use people because God gave the earth to humanity. And if Satan wants to rule the earth, he has to use people. So uh, up until such a time as the Antichrist, his false son, who will be a hybrid, uh, part um, person and part um, fallen angel, Apollyon. Up until that time, though, Satan has to use minions, okay, people here, people that that will sell their soul basically to him. Uh, these people operate under a lot of demonic um, oppression and um, demonic power. And Satan's plan is not a good plan, but God is allowing him to work his plan up until the very end. And then the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, the head of the seed of the serpent. So what I want to do today is I want to give you some of the bad news. I'm going to give you a timeline. I'm going to show you the typical pre-tribulation timeline. I'm going to point out a couple of problems with that as I've been doing in my uh, the videos that I've been doing just before this one, I've been pointing out some real serious problems that are present in the typical pre-tribulation um, rapture scenario timeline. So what I've done here on my lovely whiteboard is I have written the typical pre-tribulation uh, timeline. I understand this timeline. I, I used to teach it. Okay, so I, I understand the pre-trib position. I also understand the problems with it. And the typical tribulation, pre-tribulation timeline is based on a seven-year tribulation, which according to dispensationalists is the time of the wrath of God. So the wrath of God lasts seven years, okay? It's, it's, it's wrath. It's uh, the tribulation. They define that as wrath and that this whole seven years is basically the day of the Lord, the wrath of God, and so on. So all the seals are opened and then all the trumpets and then you get the abomination of desolation taking place and then you have the seven bowls of the wrath of God and uh, then you have the second coming of Christ. The rapture of the church, they believe that the church 
uh, in its entirety is raptured right here. There's only one rapture in this um, understanding, this uh, es particular eschatology. And the rapture happens here either right at the time the Antichrist confirms a covenant, according to what how they read Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, or the rapture may happen just a little bit prior to that. They believe that the bride of Christ is raptured. There's a wedding supper that lasts seven years in heaven, and then uh, Jesus and everybody will come back at the second coming. Okay? The this whole timeline is called tribulation. This last half is called great tribulation. It lasts 42 months, 1,260 days, three and a half years, or time times and half a time. Okay, so this is how uh, basically a pre-tribulation eschatology goes. Now, in my last video, I talked about how uh, this particular timeline doesn't mesh with Matthew 24, which shows us that the sun going dark, moon turning to blood, and so on is after, will be after the tribulation of these days, okay? In other words, the abomination has to take place. And then the sixth seal will be over here somewhere uh, just before the second coming of Christ. So um, I hope you'll take a look at that video if you haven't done so already, because to me that is one of the smoking guns of why this seven-year tribulation thing isn't correct. Um, people look at the passage in Daniel 9.27. They see that someone confirms a covenant and they believe that it's the one who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Actually, that was Titus under the Roman um, army that came in and destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Okay, That's the people of the prince who is to come. The prince who is to come was Titus. The people were the Romans. Okay, and then when it talks about he shall confirm a covenant, people think, oh, that must be Titus, or it must be a Roman person like like him. Okay, and uh, they think that he is the one who confirms the covenant. Actually, to be grammatically correct, you actually have to go back to the last singular masculine noun. That's not part of a prepositional phrase, which is a lot of fancy way to say that the he is actually the Messiah who is cut off. That's the he who confirms the covenant. And isn't it interesting that Jesus had a three and a half year ministry, that he was cut off when, and put an end to sacrifice and offering when he died on the cross. That is the need for sacrificial offerings went away because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Okay, Jesus was the one who confirmed the new covenant in his blood. There's a lot of verses, um, there's a lot of scriptures, and there's a lot of old um, Christian commentaries that support the idea of the first half of Daniel's 70th week already having been fulfilled. And it will start back up again at the abomination of desolation. Okay, so this is the typical um, scenario, and people who believe in a dis dispensational theology, tend to read the book of Revelation chronologically, even though they'll tell you it's not chronological. They'll have all the seals have to be opened first, and then they'll have all the trumpets that need to be opened second, and then they'll have uh, the bulls of wrath third. And, uh, you know, they have <laughs> the trumpets coming out of the seventh seal and the bulls coming out of the seventh trumpet and so on and so forth. It's all quite ridiculous when you actually look at it. We know that the second woe is associated with the time of the abomination of desolation, which is when the mark of the beast will sort of begin. The second woe is the sixth trumpet, okay? The sixth trumpet is what Revelation um, has as a placeholder for the abomination of desolation. So Revelation doesn't talk about the abomination of desolation, but we know that when the sixth trumpet sounds, this is the second woe, we know that that is at, will be at the same time as the abomination of desolation. Okay, so the sixth trumpet is right here, and then 42 months later is the seventh trumpet, when everything is over and Christ 
has made the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And that's when the unresurrected dead of believers who haven't been raised from the dead yet will be raised. The um, martyrs of the beast, those who are beheaded, are going to be raised at the seventh trumpet as well. And that's when people are going to be rewarded according to uh, Revelation chapter 11. Okay, so here is how I see things. Okay, this is how I'm reading the book of Revelation. And by the way, I had to do a lot of this backward, um, counting day counts going backward. And I believe that the feasts of the Lord are uh, prophetic, that they tell the story of redemption in a prophetic way, and that Christ is has multiple fulfillments of the Day of Atonement. Uh, he's already fulfilled the Day of Atonement at least twice during his earthly ministry, okay? And there, there is more than one fulfillment of, of the feast days, and I believe that he'll fulfill it again at his second coming. So what I've done is um, taken the second coming of Christ, and the Day of Atonement is going to be associated with the second coming. And then if you just find the Day of Atonement in any year, and you subtract 1,260 days, you'll end up on this day here, which almost always, um, according to the Hebrew calendars that you read, is the day when um, the Israelites cross the Red Sea. Okay, that's the crossing of the Red Sea is right here. Three and a half days before that is first fruits. Okay, and before that then is Passover. And we know that this day right here, when the Israelites cross the Red Sea, is the same day that they're going to go through the opening in the Mount of Olives, cross through and be in the wilderness for 1,260 days. Okay, in the last video I showed you that the sixth and seventh seal are gonna be right here on an unknown date, and that there is a rapture that's gonna take place just prior to this or right around this time, that's the third rapture in Revelation 15 and Revelation 14, 14. Uh, this is when uh, believers are going to be taken into heaven. They're going to go on a cloud. These are those who are alive and remain. This is when Christ comes on the cloud with a golden sickle and harvests the earth before um, this day right here before the wrath of God in um, in the seven bowls begins. Okay, the wrath of God will uh, begin once we get to Revelation 15 and 16. The sixth trumpet, the second woe, this is when I believe will be the end of World War III. Okay, that's the end of World War III. The other thing that's going to happen at the time of the second woe, the sixth trumpet, this is when the two witnesses are going to rise from the dead and ascend. Okay, so uh, if we count back three and a half days, we'll get to first fruits. Okay, and so that's the day that the two witnesses are killed. Okay, and if we count back 1,260 days, we would arrive at the day that they begin their ministry. And by the way, the two witnesses, just because they're here for 1,260 days before the time of the abomination, does not mean that this is tribulation. Okay, this is not tribulation, and they are not prophesied in Daniel's 70th week. They're just here, okay, because... Uh, the book of Malachi tells us that Elijah and most likely Moses are going to be here to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and children to the fathers. Okay, they're going to work with Israel. They're a part of the story for Israel. They, they're not a part of our story. That's why it doesn't matter to us as believers right now. If they're here, they're not here, whatever, it doesn't matter. They don't minister to us. They have nothing to do with us. They are here for Israel. They're here to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and children to the fathers, lest they come and smite the land with a curse. They're also going to be the ones who rebuild the temple. They're the two olive trees and the two lampstands, just like Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest in Zechariah chapter 4. They're going to do other things as well, but they have a private ministry with 
people in Israel, and I believe it's because of their ministry that the 144,000 will come to Christ and that the remnant of Israel, while they don't um, turn to Christ in the same way that uh, 144,000 are going to be believers, they are going to be uh, absorbing what it is the two witnesses are telling them so that when um, they find out, you know, that this abomination thing has happened, uh, they will take heed and run and flee into the wilderness. There is a limited amount of time when this uh, mountain is going to be opened, uh, when the Mount of Olives splits and they flee through that opening into the wilderness. The Satan, the dragon, is going to come after them with a flood, just like uh, Pharaoh did with his troops, um, and, but the mountain is going to close back up again. And if the Israelites are not on the other side of that, the remnant of Israel, um, they are not going to make it through that opening. They'll be trapped in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is going to be um, pretty much destroyed. Okay, this is when the end of World War III happens. This is the bad news. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Um, Zechariah tells us that armies are going to gather against Jerusalem, okay, and that um, people's eyes are going to melt in their sockets. And when Jesus says, come out of her, my people, he's not talking to believers. He is talking to the remnant of Israel, telling them, get out of Jerusalem, come with me, or you will suffer the fate of the harlot. You'll be caught in her destruction, okay? The harlot, Mystery Babylon, is going to be destroyed. Israel's covenant with death is going to be annulled, okay? Whatever agreement the nation of Israel makes with the harlot, the beast, or whoever, that is going to be over and done with, and they are going to be um, have an, basically be destroyed along with the rest of the harlot, okay, at that same time. And I believe... Whoever is part of this, you know, great reset, so on and so forth, is a part of the harlot that will be destroyed at this point in time because the beast and the harlot do not get along and they are not going to reign at the same time. Okay, the beast hates the harlot. He and the ten kings will destroy the harlot with fire, smoke, and sulfur, which is exactly what will happen at the sixth trumpet. A 200 million man army um, with four fallen angel generals commanding all of this are going to... Um, destroy a third of the earth's population, okay, at this point in time. Okay, that's bad news, all right, but let's keep working backward here, okay? So there's going to be Christians who are martyred during a 10-day persecution. The 10-day persecution will end on first fruits the same day the two witnesses are killed. Another thing that ends on first fruits is 150 days or five months that the locust army is tormenting people who aren't sealed. Okay, that will end on first fruits. The two witnesses are killed on first fruits. The 144,000 will be raptured. Let's see if I can figure out where to put that. Okay, let's just do this. Rapture. Number two is of the 144,000 who are kept from the hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. The hour of trial is not metaphorical. It's the hour, day, month, and year. It's the hour that um, Jerusalem falls at the time of the two witnesses. It's in that hour when the gospel angels say that Babylon has fallen, give God glory. And in that hour, they give God glory. The hour in Revelation, with uh, the one exception, uh, is about the sixth trumpet destruction of the harlot mystery Babylon. This is a big deal. This is World War III. This is the end of the Great Reset. Okay, Whatever things that um, this current Babylonian system has acquired will be put into the hands of the beast who will begin to reign right here the beast and the false prophet along with the dragon okay are going to reign on this side no harlot there'll be 
vestiges of the harlot because there will still be uh, some who don't give up their worship of idols and so on and so forth. And whatever is left of this Babylonian system that we've been under since the time of Nimrod will be destroyed here just before Christ returns at the seventh bowl. This is going to be a very bad day. Okay, this is a very, very bad day. So when Christ is talking about the birth pangs, you know, there's wars and rumors of wars and so on. You know, there's famine and pestilence and don't worry about that. Things are, they're going to get bad. They get really bad right here. They get really bad for Israel. But most believers will already be gone. Okay, most believers will have either been raptured before or killed right here during this 10 days of tribulation when the, mar, um, when the harlot and the earth dwellers are killing believers, okay, by the millions. There's so many that appear in heaven in Revelation chapter 7, um, standing in front of God. And they're Christians, otherwise they wouldn't be in heaven, okay? You can't get to heaven unless you're a Christian. You have to be a believer. And so this is one of the other things that really bugs me, and I'm just going to state this so those of you who want to talk about we have the rapture of the church. And people will say, you don't see the church, you know, after Revelation chapter 4, okay, when John is told, come up here, and people will say that the church is gone and isn't present. So the fifth seal martyrs, the 144,000, those who are beheaded by the beast, that group of overcomers who overcomes the beast and the number of his name and all of that, They'll say these aren't Christians, they're not part of the church, because the church is not seen in Revelation after chapter 4. Here's the facts, though, folks. Okay, When Paul talks about the church, he is talking about the church universal. And that actually includes even Old Testament saints, because they're going to live in the New Jerusalem. Okay, You have to be part of the bride to live in New Jerusalem. Okay, so Abraham and Moses and all these people, read Hebrews 11 and 12, and you'll see... Old Testament saints are part of the church. So when Paul's talking about the church universal as the body of Christ, that's one sense that people think about the church. But Revelation doesn't talk about the church like that. In fact, in Revelation chapter chapters 2 and 3, we're talking about churches. That is, churches, individual assemblies, that meet together, individual little groups, little bit, little groups of people who meet together. This is not the church universal that Paul is talking about. The book of Revelation never talks about the universal group of believers that make up the body of Christ and never calls it the church. You know what it's called? <laughs> They're the people who inhabit the new Jerusalem, the bride who doesn't show up until the end of the millennium. Okay, that's when the holy city comes down. The city is finally ready. The city's not ready for the bride until the end of the millennium. And that's when the, we meet up with the bride and the, the holy city. So the New Jerusalem, the occupants of the New Jerusalem are the church in the book of Revelation. There is no rapture of the church and there is no rapture of the bride because the bride doesn't even exist until all believers, including those who are going to live and die during what people call the tribulation, uh, until they're all in heaven and have, you know, been glorified and are in their proper positions and so on and so forth. All right, so got that off my chest. There are a lot of things that really bother me about um, the um, ingenuousness of pre tribulation rapture eschatology, okay, and the whole idea that you know, of, of the church being raptured when Revelation doesn't even talk about the church, okay? That's a Pauline thing, okay, of the church. It's not a Revelation thing. And we need to be able to distinguish, you know, what we're looking at in Revelation, and we're not looking at Pauline doctrine. All these people who live and die here are part of the church, okay? And the letters to the seven churches are written to individual groups of people who will be living during this end time period. All right, so let's look at some more bad news, okay? So seals uh, one through four, 
talk about um, the basically the Antichrist, the, the seventh king who will die and come back again, be raised from the dead and indwelt by Apollyon, okay, the beast who ascends from the bottomless pit, who is the one who kills the two witnesses. Okay, so somebody is going to kill the seventh king so that he becomes the eighth king, okay? And I believe that it's the two witnesses who are going to kill um, the seventh king. They're going to kill the pre-antichrist, okay? Because this guy does not become the antichrist until he rises from the dead, okay? And becomes the beast who rises from the sea of death, okay? Rises from the sea and is indwelt by Apollyon, okay? Which means the fifth trumpet has to sound before the beast can begin to reign, okay? The pit has to be opened so Apollyon can be released to indwell the man who is going to become the Antichrist. Okay, so the fifth, if the sixth trumpet is here, the fifth trumpet is back here somewhere, and we know it's that the fifth trumpet events will be over before the sixth trumpet uh, events begin, because that's what it says in Revelation 9. Okay, so five months, 150 days will take us to this day here. Okay, and, and once we uh, know something, uh, once we get a date over on this side, we'll be able to actually plug in dates for all of these other things. Okay, and that's one of the reasons for the book of Revelation is so that we would know what's going to happen. The end of World War III is right here. I believe World War III has already started. Sort of like World War I started when uh, an Archduke got assassinated, okay? And that led to a series of events that ended up in uh, with us being in World War I. And I suppose for right now, we could actually go back to when the virus, you know, end of 2019, 2020, um, when all of that started happening. I believe that's when the globalists, the, you know, the harlot, the, Mab the Babylonian system, the powers that be, whatever, that they started... Um, playing their cards, playing their hand, and I think they were able to see that they were able to actually control basically the whole world. Put the whole world on lockdown, tell people what to do, uh, what to wear, what to uh, do to their bodies, and uh, I think that was a trial balloon for how effective are, will they be once they really start the real thing, which I believe has already started. Okay, so it's it's going to ramp up, and I think by this fall, things are going to be very, very, very bad. Okay, so the seals one through four, the rider on the white horse, then you have peace being taken from the earth. Okay, and if you think um, the things that are happening now are bad, you haven't seen nothing yet. There's going to be wars, and just, you know, try going shopping. Try parking your car and not being um, carjacked, you know. Try, you know, going to school or anything. Peace will be taken from the earth and there's going to be a, just this spirit of violence that's going to overtake people. And a lot of bloodshed. And then food is going to be scarce. And then, of course, because of that, uh, there's going to be death and pestilence and, you know, wild beasts will start moving in. It's going to be a bad thing. Very, very bad. But it's not a judgment yet. Okay, this is what, this is what the powers that be are wanting to do. Okay, now there are some other things that are going to happen that aren't really a part of what the harlot is wanting to do. And remember, she's been in control since the time of Nimrod, um, Tower of Babel, and will be up until World War III, Sixth Trumpet. Okay, and that's when the power, Satan is going to uh, hand the power. Uh, he's going to get rid of the harlot and he's going to give the power. His power is thrown as great authority to the beast. Okay right here. Okay, if you can find a flaw in my in my reasoning here from the book of Revelation, let me know. I, I think I've been through it with a fine tooth comb and I think I, I think I finally got it. <laughs> but if there's something wrong with what I'm saying and I can't, you know, prove to you that what I'm saying is like actually in the Bible, um, I'm very interested in knowing that because I want to get this right. Okay. All right, so trumpets one through four tend to be cosmic things. It's stuff, you know, mountain, uh, firing mountain being thrown into the sea and wormwood and stuff, uh, blood and hail and fire and a third of the, you know, light not coming to the earth. To me, that all spells like meteors, asteroids, you know, stuff happening that is from 
outside of the earth that is going to happen with the first four trumpets. Okay, so the first four seals are a group and the first four trumpets are a group. And I have a feeling that they'll all begin in earnest on the same day. All of this will be the same day. Okay, and between when the trumpets and seals and stuff start and when the fifth trumpet is, I think there will probably be about a month. Maybe a little less, maybe three weeks. When is the first rapture? When are we going to be raptured? Okay, we're going to be raptured after the woman goes into travail. Okay, the Revelation 12 sign was back here. That was in uh, September of 2017. 2017 was the 70th anniversary of the resolution creating the state of Israel. 70th anniversary, folks. Add 80 years, the upper limit, to 2017, Jesus would need to return by uh, 2027 or 2028 at the latest. Okay? So that's, that's what we're looking at here, which would mean right here, uh, if we were to subtract three and a half years from the Day of Atonement to the time of what we would call the midpoint, okay, of, of a seven-year timeline, um, the, the latest this can be is 2024, most likely 2023. If it's in 2023, which would be next year, that means our rapture is this fall. If it's in 2024, then our rapture will be next fall. So you're going to go, well, aren't there, shouldn't there be three and a half years on this side? Uh, no. <laughs> The first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week are already fulfilled in the life of Christ. Okay, so now we just work backward to determine what some of this other stuff is. And actually, we have enough information in the book of Revelation to be able to do that. We know that the rapture has to happen sometime between 2017 and 2024. Okay, All right. But we don't need three and a half years between the rapture and the abomination of desolation. The world is not going to carry on that long. Okay? Not at the rate it's going. That will not happen. And the Antichrist does not confirm a covenant. Okay? None of this is correct. This is all incorrect. Don't hang your hat on that. They're wrong. Okay? It's wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay? It's wrong. It's not true. It can't be supported. Um, from other scriptures. Okay, and to me, that's the most important thing. You have to be able to biblically support what you're talking about. You need to do that, and, and you need to look at options. Okay, and if you've been trained in a certain denominational way of thinking, you need to be honest. Okay, and, and if it isn't working, just say it's not working. Okay, just be honest. Don't keep pushing an agenda or a, a plan that isn't you know, can't be supported biblically, okay? And I think in the last video I did, it was very clear where the wrath of God begins, very clear where the sixth seal is opened. Very clear. I would be willing to um, debate anybody about this point, okay? So the seals and the trumpets, all of that are going to happen all at once, okay? And it's in the middle of all of this chaos that the harlot is really going to uh, take advantage of this. And I believe that the New World Order, the Great Reset people, whoever, they they have an idea about what is coming from out there. What's going to be coming in. They have an idea about that. And somebody asked somebody, you know, do you think that the powers that be that, you know, are in the world right now, that they understand the book of Revelation, and I believe the answer is yes, I think they do. I think they know very well what is happening. Satan knows what's happening. He knows how much time he has. He knows what he needs to get in place. And remember, Satan has a plan, and he's working his plan. He's always had a plan. He said plan A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever it took to be able to get his son on, uh, on the throne of the world, to be king of the world. Okay. So we've got the Revelation 12 sign. I believe that was a real deal. It really happened in the starry heavens. That sort of is our indication that we're in the book of Revelation. We're not in the wrath. 
We're not in tribulation because the tribulation isn't a thing in the Bible. It doesn't exist the way people say it does. It's not there, okay? <laughs> it's just not there. Okay, so we're in the book of Revelation right now. We're waiting for the second sign, the sign of the dragon. How much time between um, the Revelation 12 sign, the first sign, and the second sign? I don't know. We don't know. That's a mystery right here. But what we're looking for is Satan's going to cast a third of his stars to heaven, um, from heaven to the earth. Okay, that's his wicked stars there. And the woman, Israel, is going to go into travail. There, that's a war or an invasion, okay? It's something very, very, very bad, very painful for her. She is going to go into travail. There's a war, okay? When a woman is in travail, the travail ends when the child is born, okay? So when the war ends, that is when the child of Revelation 12, the man-child, the firstborn, the one who's going to inherit, the one who's going to be caught up to God into his throne, where he's going to be seated on 24 thrones with crowns and, um, you know, bowls of incense and so on and so forth. This is the rapture, uh, the first rapture of the firstborn, Sons who inherit, they're kings and priests and worshipers. They will be in heaven, okay? But before they are raptured, um, they're going to be born, which means they're going to be identified as sons. And the only way that I know of that this really works is, is the Holy Spirit, an additional um, infilling of the Holy Spirit on people who are going to be in this first group. Of raptured saints. There are people who are Christians. I believe they're born again. They have the Spirit of God living inside of them, but they love the world. They don't follow after Christ wholeheartedly. They've got a lot of sin in their life, or they just they just don't care. Okay, or they're part of the you know the the agenda that's out there that likes to use like rainbows and stuff. Okay, so these are not people who are going to go in this rapture. This is for the firstborn, okay, the one who inherits, the weos arson. This is the child who, along with Christ, is going to rule and reign as co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ. That's what this is all about. It's about being kings and priests. The elders assist Christ going to begin assisting here on earth there's going to be seven days and then just like a baby boy is circumcised the flesh is cut away he's given a new name uh, he's got an, a new identity that's going to happen on the eighth day when we go backward this way this right here this eight day is tabernacles okay tabernacles is a seven day feast um, where you're living in a tent, and on the eighth day, there is an assembly, a sacred, solemn assembly, and that's when people go to their permanent homes, okay? And this is a time of great joy, and we know that when a child is born, a woman has joy because her pain is gone, and there is a baby boy that's born into the world. That's what the Bible says. So this time period right here, in spite of all the stuff that's going on, is going to be a time of great joy. Tabernacles is the last harvest festival. All harvest festivals are associated with the giving of the Holy Spirit or with the action of the Holy Spirit. The disciples received the Holy Spirit, the first impartation on first fruits the day Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus was made alive in the Spirit. He brought the spirits of righteous Christians from Sheol into heaven. It was a transfer event um, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit is involved in all first fruits feast days. Pentecost, the disciples and the 120 who were in Jerusalem on Pentecost, they were Christ's first fruit offering. He offered them to God. No one was to appear before God empty-handed, and that included Jesus. So he offered these people as first fruits, 
And just because you're first fruits doesn't mean that you go to heaven. It means that you are um, belong to God in a particular way. So the Holy Spirit in fire came down on those people. And fire, when God puts fire on an offering, it shows that he accepts the offering. Those people were accepted by God. They were Christ's offering, the labor of his three and a half year ministry. Okay. Later that day, 3,000 people came to the Lord and they received the Holy Spirit as well. And then they went out into all the world and preached the gospel. Okay. So the only first fruits feast that has yet to be fulfilled is tabernacles. And there is one more group who is going to be firstborns who are going to be sealed in the Holy Spirit. And those are the 144,000 of Israel, they are sealed. And of course, sealing means you're sealed in the Holy Spirit. That You have God's mark or his seal, um, the signet, the mark of God is on you. And they're, the only way I know of that people have the mark of God is if they have the Holy Spirit. That is what's going to happen. So the Holy Spirit is going to be given to the 144,000 over tabernacles, which is the same time that we are identified as sons given an extra measure of the Holy Spirit and Satan is going to try to devour the child during this time but in the end the child will be caught up to God and to his throne glorified given a crown given a throne given a ministry and immediately begin to intercede for those who are on the earth okay so we've got this war in Israel, and I think this is the Gog-Magog war. This is when um, God puts a hook in the jaw of Gog and brings him down, him and his hordes, all those who are with him, into the mountains of Israel. And that's when things are start going to start to go south for Israel. Okay, so if, okay, and this is an if, if we're looking at a Feast of Tabernacles, uh, identification of sons and rapture of this year that um, the eighth day here is October 19th okay and, and this is give or take 24 hours okay so I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here what that means then is that sometime over here right about the time the war in Israel begins, which I think it's probably going to be, begin like around the Feast of Trumpets. To me, that's a signal. And the Feast of Trumpets is a signal or a sign that something is about to start with regard to the, um, the events, the prophetic events of the seventh month, the seventh Hebrew month. Okay. The Feast of, of, of Trumpets is only an announcement. Okay. It is not... Uh, the time when the dead are raised. It's not the time when people are raptured. Okay. The examples of pr previous feasts of uh, trumpets events. Okay. Well, we can look over here. Revelation 12 sign is one of them. That was our heads up. That stuff is about to happen. The star of Bethlehem happened over the feast of trumpets. Heads up. The Messiah is about to be born. John the Baptist showed up on the Feast of Trumpets. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And then Jesus showed up and was baptized, I believe, on the Day of Atonement. So the Feast of Trumpets is just an announcement. It's to get your attention. And I think the war in Israel would really get our attention. And that would be um, then in late September sometime. And while the war is going on, we got two witnesses who are going to be building a temple. They're going to be erecting the tabernacle of David. Okay, because when it when it comes to um, dispensations, okay, uh, when it comes to time periods, what time period are we in? We're not in the time of the law, which is what the tabernacle of Moses was all about. And we're not yet into the temple of Solomon, which is what the millennial kingdom is prophetic of. We're in that middle time of the tabernacle of David where priest kings like David, who was a king, put on the linen ephod like a priest and went and sat in the presence of the ark right there. No veil between him and God. He sat in the very presence of God. There were others who sat there with him. There were musicians and scribes and singers and so on that 
could be seated right in the very presence of God. And in Acts chapter 15, when the disciples were trying to decide, do new converts need to become Jews first? What they said, what James said was, um, this is basically what we're looking at here is the tabernacle of David so the Gentiles can come in. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. So when the temple is rebuilt, it's not the Temple Institute that's going to build this thing, and it's not the Antichrist who's going to build it. It's the two witnesses, the two olive trees and the two lampstands erect that tabernacle. Okay, and it's very possible that Christ may actually be here to help them do that because um, there are the two olive trees and the two lampstands who stand beside the Lord of all the earth. That is, the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands who stand beside the Lord of all the earth. Well, the Lord of all the earth probably needs to be there, okay, and that's Jesus. And that would be then the fulfillment of the transfiguration prophecy, which also happened, I believe, on the Day of Atonement during Jesus' lifetime. I have videos on all of this. Okay, so what that means is between now and the end of September, we can expect some really, really bad stuff. That is if we're actually going to um, be raptured this year, okay? And if we're not raptured this year, it's gonna just be a really rough winter for everybody. This is gonna be really, really bad. Okay, and it's going to get exponentially worse. But from what I see happening in the world, I don't know that we can actually go another year, but who knows? <laughs> I could be surprised. And we still have time to still be within that 80-year um, upper limit of the fig tree prophecy. So I, I am not at all worried about that. Okay, and it does look like all the events in the world are converging together to make this happen. I want to talk about one more thing here, and that is this Passover right here, just before the abomination of desolation. If we have the seventh king coming out, he's going to need to die and rise from the dead before the abomination happens. Okay. Revelation chapter 11 tells us that anybody who comes against the two witnesses, and by the way, I think their ministry will go public when they erect the tabernacle of David. That's when people will, will know who they are. That's when they're going to be recognized for who they are. And by the time um, we're in heaven, we have the 144,000 who are like worshiping in that rebuilt temple, according to Revelation chapter 11. There are already worshipers there, and John's told to count them. And the only people who are really counted in Revelation are the 144,000. Okay. And this is a symbolic number. There may be more, there may be less. It's a symbolic number. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. 12 is the number of divine government. So anybody who comes against the two witnesses will be killed. And the two witnesses have power to kill anybody or to do any plague against anyone who comes against them. If the seventh king comes against the two witnesses, they will kill him. They will kill him. Okay. And I believe that he will die on Passover. And he will rise from the dead on first fruits. All this just like Jesus. And once the beast who ascends from the bottomless pit, beast from the sea, rises from the sea of death, he will kill the two witnesses that same day. That same day, there is something else that happens here on first fruits. This is an extremely important day, and I think that this, what I'm going to tell you now is the really bad news, okay? If you've hung in there this long, this is the really bad news. This is the day that Satan is cast out of heaven. He's going to stand on the sand of the sea and wait for his son to rise from the dead. And once his fake son, the, the beast who ascends from the sea, the beast who ascends from the bottomless pit, rises from the sea of death, once he becomes this hybrid or indwelt by a Polyon person, the dragon is going to give him his power, his throne, and his great authority. The beast is going to war against the harlot. And that's going to start right back here with the first seal. He's going out conquering and to conquer. Who is he opposed to? Well, 
in the beginning, he's opposed to Mystery Babylon. He hates her. And he is going to be working against the harlot. Okay, and people who see what's going on when they see this guy rise up and he's coming against the Klaus Schwabs and the so on and so forth, they're going to think he's a hero. And then when they see the two witnesses have killed him, they, people are going to be so mad. They're going to be so angry. And once this guy rises from the dead, and on the same day that Satan is cast out of heaven on first fruits, people are going to be ecstatic. Okay, for three and a half days, they're going to give each other presents. It's just going to be this awesome thing. But how is Satan going to come to the earth when he and his fallen angels come to the earth? What is it going to look like? It's going to look like the second coming of Christ. He is not going to come like some, you know, red-tailed, horned guy who's just falling out of the sky. He's going to show up in glory, okay, disguised as an angel of light and beautiful and glorious. And all of his fallen angels who've been living in heaven are going to be here too, and they're going to show up glorious. It's going to look like the second coming of Christ. Okay, that's the really bad news. And then when this guy rises from the dead on first fruits and this, you know, <laughs> the second coming is here and it looks like God is the dwelling place of God is with men here on earth. Okay, we'll just skip over the whole millennium thing. We'll go straight to the dwelling place of God. Only Satan, the dragon, is going to be living here with all of his fallen angels. And here is his false son. People are going to worship him and people are going to be tricked into believing that all of this glory that they see is actually from God. Okay, this is part of the great deception. People don't realize that when Satan... Uh, is cast out of heaven at the end of the 10 days, okay? I think that the earth reflects what's going on in heaven. So if there's 10 days of tribulation here for God's people, there'll probably be a war in heaven for 10 days as well. At the end of the 10 days, by the, that time, the harlot is finished killing all the believers for the most part. There'll be a few who will be left and go on into the reign of the beast. Not many, almost all will be dead. Or if you're one, one of the 144,000, you'll be raptured on first fruits. Okay. But the dragon is going to look like it's heaven on earth. And so, you know, when Jesus comes uh, for the millennium, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to make people do things. And we're going to rule with a rod of iron with him. We are going to help him rule. There's going to be people. Not everybody's going to die. The remnant of Israel will go on to live during the millennium. There's going to be people from the nations who still survive um, all of this <laughs> and, uh, you know, the wrath of God. Uh, in Noah's day, only eight people survived, but uh, Matthew 24 tells us that one person is taken and one is left. That, that What that means is only one out of, you know, 50% die. Okay, otherwise, you know, there's going to be people who survive. And people who survive from the nations are the sheep who will go into the millennium and re reproduce and repopulate the earth and so on. But Jesus is going to rule these people with a rod of iron. Everybody's going to have to follow the rules. The dragon and the beast are going to do the same thing. Everybody has to follow the rules. The rule is that you worship these people who are in the image of the beast, okay, and they're people, okay, this is, people are the image of the beast, it's not an idol, an idol is a different word, and Revelation uses both image and idol, and image has to do with people who bear the image of the beast, just like we have the image of God, we bear the image of Christ, these people, hybrids, are going to have to be worshipped, um, and people are going to have to take the mark and pledge allegiance to the beast, and the, the really great thing, though, is that right here, at the time of the sixth trumpet, God is going to send out, it says, three angels. And they're going to say three things. Worship God only who created everything. And Babylon has fallen, because Babylon has fallen right here. And 
Do not take the mark. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship the image of the beast or you'll go into the lake of fire. Okay, right here. All, people are going to know exactly what's going on. Exactly. So if they take the mark or they worship the beast or the image of the beast um, or the number of his name or any of that, they will go into the lake of fire. But you can see how even the elect, even Christians, could be deceived into believing that when Satan comes in glory with all of his angels with him and the beast rises from the dead on first fruits and kills the two witnesses, okay, how, how people will think that this is, this is God come to dwell with men. The tabernacle of God is with men. That's the very bad news. And that is where I believe that people are going to fall, um, have, that people could fall into this deception. This is a huge deception. Okay, so one of the things I hope I've done is made Revelation come alive for you. I hope you can see that there's a very big story here. It's a lot more interesting than whatever this thing is up here. Okay, that, that can't be defended. And the other thing I want you to know is that once these things begin, it's going to happen really, really fast. It's all going to be very compressed. But the time between uh, the war in Israel and when the abomination takes place is about six months. That's it. Okay. Trumpets one through six, seals one through five. Uh, the death and resurrection of the beast. Um, World War Three, the end of World War Three, all of that. Six months. And... Once this gets going, it's going to positively go parabolic. I guess I should ask this question now. What about you? Okay. Do you know Jesus? If you don't, today is a good day to get saved. Today is a good day to say, you know, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying on the cross for my sins. And you need to be born again. Ask for the Holy Spirit to come into your life and cause you to be born again. You can't do that yourself. Only God can do that for you, but he will. It, he said, uh, the scriptures tell us how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So ask for him to give you his Holy Spirit. Okay. If you're a believer who is, you know, made it thus far in the video and you're watching and waiting for the Lord's return, good for you. Um, walk in faithfulness, you know, love your neighbor, you know, do good. You know, confess your sins. Um, you know, just keep 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 doing what you're doing. If you're someone who has fallen into sin, and you don't think that all this is important, and you're just in love with the world, and you're pursuing your own whatevers, I would, I would, um, I would start to think differently. If I was you, I would go to the Lord and go, Hey, you know, Lord, I I don't I don't know about this stuff that Brenda's been saying, but I think that maybe some of this stuff may be true. And is there anything that needs to change in my life? And I'm willing to do what you want me to do. I'm willing to follow after you. I'm willing to change. I want to be taken in this rapture right here. Okay. I want to go in that one. I don't want to necessarily have to die, which most Christians who's, who who are going to be left here during this um, time after the first rapture. They're going to be killed over here during that 10 days. So if you're, if you got any questions at all about where you stand with the Lord and you, you know, you're a believer, you've been born again. Um, you need to spend a little time with the Lord and ask him about this stuff and he'll let you know. And if you got things you need to make right with him, it's a good time to like get your relationship with the Lord uh, back on, you know, loving, uh, speaking terms again. And if you're somebody um, who is like using God's people for your own gain, and I doubt that you're watching this video because you got your own thing going, um, you are in danger of apostasy. Okay, you are in danger of, of very bad things happening to you and losing your inheritance totally losing your inheritance. You don't want to be that person. But I doubt that you're watching this video, so I'm not going to emphasize that because, uh, you know, you, you've probably already seared your conscience. So <laughs> uh, you're kind of on your own. All right. So 
this is a long video. I realize that. I'm working on um, uh, a handout, a kind of a long synopsis of all this stuff that I've talked about plus more. If you want to learn more, look at my videos. I, I, you know, I'd like to be able to answer questions in the comments section, but I only have so much time and I need to be working on some other things for you. And especially if we're getting to the end here, I want some stuff to be able to, you know, give to you guys so that you can print it out while there's still time and have it available for people uh, that you care about who may be left behind. Now, during this uh, eight days right here, the seven days, and then we leave on the eighth day, during that period of time, you'll actually have opportunity to share, I believe, with people in your family. This rapture is not going to be secret. Okay, everybody's gonna know. People are gonna know where we've gone. People are gonna know uh, who's left. Not a secret. And when the 144,000 leave on first fruits, they know when they're going to be going too. So this is not uh, a mystery. You know, they'll be leaving uh, 10 days um, at the end of the 10 days of tribulation. So they know when that is. It's only this group right here, this third rapture group. They don't know. Uh, that's on a day that nobody knows the day or the hour because it coincides uh, and it's connected with the time of the wrath of God. Okay, so I realize that this is a lot of scribbly stuff here. I hope you're able to follow it. You may want to watch this video again. Take notes. Um, make your own little drawing. Make it neat so you can read what it says and all of that. So um, it's been my pleasure to serve you today. I, I do hope you'll leave a comment in the comment section. I hope you'll share this video with somebody else. And until the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day.